Hey, welcome to episode 3 of Strategy Shorts, Why They Always Have It. In Duelist, there are a few cards that are much maligned for being insanely powerful, right? Everyone goes on Discord and complains, oh, they had the Revenant, oh, they had the War Beast, oh, they had Holy Immolation, I'm so sick of this card, it should be nerfed. I mean, nowadays people usually complain about different, newer cards, we've gotten used to the old, old guard, but... These cards are still, you know, among the best in the game. The three I just named, Holy Immolation, Mechanta Warbeast, and Spectral Revenant, are three of the key cards of their respective factions. Less so Immolation, or the Alabaster Titan's a thing, but um, go with me on this one. Um, they are very powerful, capable of dealing face damage and killing a minion and deploying a big tempo swing at the same time. And as the opponent of a card like this, you usually have to find yourself playing around it, respecting it, spreading your forces out something in order to mitigate the impact of this insanely powerful ability. Um, in the other factions, there's things like how the Songhai player always seems to have the double Phoenix Fire to finish you off, how the Vanar player always has Chromatic Cold or Frigid Corona or Frostburn or some horrible piece of combo. Um, and Vitruvian, they have things like Blood of Air, right? They always have the Blood of Air. Um, and even things like Sion's First Wish, Fireblaze Obelisk, Inmara Healer, Falcius, these other less obviously bomby but still very powerful swingy cards so some of the oh my god they always have five copies of this card every game some of that's sold but there is actually a, a truth in it especially in duelist and that truth lies in the replace mechanic because of the fact that most of these cards are relatively expensive or take a little while to set up right minion plus holy immolation is six mana mechanical war beast is six mana um Imara is 6 mana, Blood of Air is 5, Revenant 7. You know, they're relatively expensive cards. And they're very powerful. Um, so people will tend to hold on to them. You get this situation where, over the course of the game, if you draw this card, especially outside of your opening hand, you're quite likely to hold on to it. And thanks to the replace mechanic, you get a lot of chances to see it, especially if you're running 3 copies. So before I started recording, I did some rough maths. Calculating chances of drawing a card in Duelist is very difficult because of the replace not actually shrinking your deck and not being able to draw the same card twice. But roughly speaking, say your um, your opponent is a Magma player, they went first, so it's going to be turn five when they might play their Mechanta War Beast. So before that time, they've had five cards in their opening hand, two cards they can replace from their opening hand. On turn one, they have a replace and then a draw at end of turn. Turn two, they have a replace and draw, etc. And then on turn 5, they have their last replace. So this adds up to 5 plus 2, plus 2 times 4 for the preceding turns, plus 1 for the, the final replace on turn 5, which, assuming I don't mess this up, adds up to 16, I think? 5 and 2 is 7. Yeah, so they've had 16 chances to draw one of their three Mechanta War Beasts. And every time they do that, there's going to be somewhere between 39 and, let's say, 30 cards in the deck. That's between 1 in 13 and 1 in 10. They have 16 chances of that. It's pretty high, right, that they're going to get a Mechantor at some point. And because the card is very powerful, generically strong, useful in a lot of matchups, a lot of situations, the chances are they're going to hold on to it. You know, maybe if they draw more than one, they'll replace the second copy, because it is a six drop. But, you know, odds are they'll see one at some point, and they'll keep it in their hand. And this, they can have all sorts of reasons for holding on to it, but because these cards are so obviously strong... Um, you know, there can be anything from, well, I'm new, but someone on Discord told me Spectral Revenant was the best card in the game, so I guess I'll hold on to it, and hopefully it'll kill my opponent, to, you know, really experienced players doing things like, well, I mulliganed in order to sculpt my turn one with the intention of killing my opponent with Spectral Revenant on curve, you know, down the line. And so either, either way, like, regardless of your opponent's game plan, experience level, chances are these cards fit into it, right? If they're trying to burst you down... They deal face damage. If they're trying to defend you, they deal AoE damage to minions. So, these kind of linchpin cards show up every game, or almost every game, sometimes multiple times a game, with regularity, and almost always on curve. Right? They, they always, air quotes, have it. So what can you do about this besides complaining on Reddit? Well, you can play around them, you can plan around them, um, and you can try and win beforehand. So let's break that down. Um, playing around them. So some of these cards, so Holy Immolation and uh, War Beast, are area of effect damage, right? They deal a moderate amount of damage 
but they did it to multiple targets. So there's a couple of ways you can mitigate that. One of them is by playing units with too much health. So if you, especially nowadays, Thunderhorn is a card. It's very popular. doesn't die to either of those. Um, so your opponent will have to come over and hit it, which maybe they won't be able to reach to do, or they don't want to take the four damage, especially from a Thunderhorn. Um, you can spread your units out, you know, if there's enough space between them where they can't both get hit at once. That's not always practical, but it's much more... It's usually more possible than you'd expect. One trick that took me an embarrassing amount of time to learn was instead of moving and then playing something behind me to protect it, play the unit next to me and then move. And that way my opponent can't blow me out with the Warbies. And even if they can kill it with their face or something, they're not walking after me. They're staying where they, where they are in order to hit it. And so I get a couple of turns of reprieve, which is often worth a card if they're, you know, you're being chased down by a giant Varth or something. Um... You can prepare for it by sculpting your curve or your even your deck, like in the deck building stage if one of these cards is popular, to make these things worse. Like play out your Thunderhorn on turn four. Even if you don't position around the War Beast, playing your high toughness units, playing things like Dualtas, which is relatively resistant to removal, um, can uh, mitigate your opponent's bomb card. And against things like Spectral Revenant, Rev is a 7 drop. It's very expensive. If you've got multiple large threats on the board and a decent life total, it doesn't actually do that much. Like, it's still a powerful card, you know, it'll remove something and hit you for 4, but then if you're threatening lethal with your remaining 2 creatures, the Rev becomes quite bad. Or, obviously, if you just kill your opponent before they get to 7 mana. But, even if your deck's not fast enough to do that, presenting multiple large threats can overwhelm most of these power cards. You know, they help. They do something. They're very rarely abjectly bad. You know, that's why they're so widely played. But um, you can overpower them by just playing a nice big mid-range strategy. Um, so let's look at the premier kind of, oh, they had it thing of each faction and just go over them specifically. I've, I've already done a bit, but it's worth clarifying. Um, so let's start with Lionar and Holy Immolation. And I guess now Alabaster Titan. Um, immolation, you can counter it early on by making sure their minions are out of position. So if you can't, if you don't have removal or some other way of interacting with the minion, at least run away from it. This is harder with Azeroth Lion, but at least with something like a Windblade Adept they play on turn one, you can always move um, away from your opponent and say move towards the edge of the board to take up the top mana tile, leaving the Windblade Adept out of position for a few turns before you can find some way of dealing with it. Um, once your opponent is going to be able to either play a minion, immolate, or um, actually get in an attack, you can spread out, as I mentioned earlier. Another thing you can do is just make it not great for them. Like, if you've got a decent life total and a big minion, the immolation doesn't do very much, and if your opponent's going to play out a 2-drop and spend a card dealing 4 damage and then maybe hit your large creature with a face to kill it or finish it off with some other you know, Arclight Sentinel or something, you're making them use a lot of resources just to basically trade one for one and get some face damage in. Which isn't even that great for them if your minion is also hitting them as they attack it, and so on. Um, Mechanta Warbeast, much the same, with the exception that you don't have to worry about their two drops. You do have to worry about Flash Reincarnation. The same thing kind of applies. You want to make it so that, especially with Flash, they don't get a good trade. If you're playing River, um, try and either... Put your heart seekers in awkward positions or don't play them at all if you suspect your opponent is going to have flash mercantor because then they'll be left with a 4-1 after attacking your heart seeker and they'll get a decent amount of damage in so try and make sure that either you know they're just killing the heart seeker with it and then you can finish it off with a katatsu after taking four because your other minions are far away um or the heart seeker is out of reach and your opponent will have to plow the mercantor into whatever's in your front line and at that point, you're making them spend two cards to maybe kill, like, a three-drop. And that's not amazing for them. So you can take advantage of the fact that they're playing... They're spending two cards to make this tempo swing. Later on, um, same thing applies as before. You know, it only deals... Only. Deals four damage. That's not that much for a six-drop. So you can play bigger minions first. And hopefully you'll have time to spread out before they reach six. Revenant. Um... Revenant is so good because it deals an enormous amount of face damage. Like, even if it's trading, 
playing defensively or just you know force force to clear a provoke it still gets the four damage to the opponent and if they have to trade with it they take four more damage it's ridiculous um so revenant is at its best when the opponent is on a lowish life total so if you can start out ahead not always easy against um punish and a, a decent removal heavy draw from an abyssian opponent is very difficult to swarm against but if you can take the early tempo and play out some big minions in the mid game you know again presenting multiple threats so the revenant only deals with one of them and then you can attack for lethal or at least close to it you'll win and as a bonus you get rewarded for this because abyss have crap aoe so you still have to you have to remember grasp of agony is a card but if you play around that as well there's not that much that they can do to clear your board they just have to focus on your life total so heal play big stuff take the tempo basically play mid-range lionr and you can make revenants look pretty silly uh, moving on to songhai so the songhai don't really have like big i guess they have zendo and eternity painter now but the thing that's always made me annoyed uh, that they had it with songhai was multiple phoenix fires for, for lethal why do they always have that well um a, a lot of songhai decks are trying to maneuver the game to a point where they can kill you with a combo usually for about 10 damage um and about six or seven mana whether it's backstab high um eight gates straight burn aggro whatever they usually they usually clock to about six or seven mana and then they'll kill you from like eight to ten health uh, even artifact high same kind of thing that's usually when their combos go off um so unless you're playing against control uh, you can usually expect your opponent to be trying to set up some sort of burst. They'll use things like Twin Strikes to stay alive, but it's all in the goal of getting chip damage in and random attacks, and then all of a sudden, whoops, you're dead. In order to do that, the Songhai player has to sculpt their hand so that they have the Phoenix Fires. So one way you can protect your life total is by making them use them on your creatures. Right? If you're Again, if you're ahead, easier said than done, but if you're ahead on board, especially if you've played around Twin Strike by either only playing one minion or by playing two big ones you can force your opponent to phoenix fire your stuff instead of you using up her resources and then you take the game into a position where you're trading board resources rather than letting them set up a combo and you can deplete their cards this way right if they're forced to constantly remove your stuff they run out of gas and they can't kill you and the other option of course is just to play loads of healing right if you hold on to your healing cards even just a couple of as a heralds in your deck can make a big difference if you draw them at the right time so don't replace them uh, unless you have to against Songhai. Things like Grove Lion can be very effective. Uh, and another note again, uh, about Raver specifically, while I'm on the subject, be aggressive. It makes the Heart Seekers much easier to deal with. Uh, who's next? Vano. Vano have a lot of things that they can always have, like combos, but um, the big ones I think are Chromatic Cold and Frostburn. So the these cards are quite powerful. I mean, Chromatic Cold is not the most broken card in the game but it's just surprisingly efficient it deals face damage it obviously it dispels so it can deal with larger minions even if it doesn't immediately kill them which also nerfs a lot of combos um chromatic cold is just a removal spell and they don't have that many of them a lot of vano decks always look like they have every answer in the world they have the aspect of the fox followed by the chromatic cold followed by the freeze effect followed by the aoe and then here's some bomb but in order to do that they have to draw a lot of cards and play them very carefully in the right order so a lot of it is just kind of overloading their threats if you if you're playing say desolators in your deck chuck out a phantasm do they want a chromatic cold it they they know you're playing desolator and desolator is a much juicier target for chromatic cold so maybe they'll use some suboptimal removal like double mana death grip or something on the phantasm now you've gotten a two for one and forced your opponent to play awkwardly um just remember that against vanna you have to respect all their tools they have aspect especially with thunderhorn frostburn which is not that not as common these days but still very powerful um chromatic cold and hearth sister warbird shenanigans as well as their actual proactive plan of comboing or luminous charge blistering scorn or whatever um if you can make their removal awkward by presenting multiple targets that demand the same spell like for instance if you're playing mechazor they have to save a chromatic code for mechazor itself so they'll deal with your cannon of mechazor inefficiently 
So you can force them to use an aspect of Shimzar on the cannon if they don't have double chromatic gold, which is much less likely than just one. Um, which and then, which in turn might mean they don't have an aspect of Shimzar to combo with a Thunderhorn later, or to deal with some bigger minion that you're playing. Um, Vanar have a lot of very efficient answers, but they're narrower than they look. And you can make, like, if, no one wants to chromatic hold an Ironcliff Guardian, right? So, same thing applies in reverse. If you bait out, play some kind of, maybe play a Thunderhorn, bait out aspect of Shimzar, and then slam an Ironcliff Guardian, your opponent's like, oh man, I can't deal with that. I have to dispel it, that doesn't do anything. Um, and you can run them out of resources that way. And finally, Vitruvian and Blood of Air. Blood of Air is a pain in the ass, uh, especially when you're trying to stick things like Night Watchers. So the main way to play around Blood of Air is just to bait it. You put down some juicy target, make sure that, if you can, uh, your units are arranged in such a way that your opponent can't kill two things with the, the Dervish, which is not always possible, but you can use the same trick with the, uh, the, the Mechanta War Beast, where you play something and then move and play something else. Um, in order to do this. You put down some decent target for it. Try and make it so that it'd be awkward for them to change to trade. They spend their entire turn removing your thing and you take some damage. That's a bit painful. And then you play your better card afterwards and hope they don't have another one. Um, with a Mara healer. A Mara is not that popular and it's usually only played as a two of. So it's not going to be as uh, reliable as the rest of these cards, as just always being there on curve. But if you can, if you have that luxury, it's really good to save a transformational removal spell. An Onyx Bear Seal, an Egg Morph, something like that. Worst comes to worst, they don't have any Mara, and you can just use it to kill a Trigon Obelisk or something. Um, or a Noshrak. There's usually targets for it. Even Nimbus, people are playing that now for some reason. <laughs> um, and it's really good. Like It seems pretty powerful in this meta. So... Um, I think is there any other cards to bear in mind i mentioned alabaster titan earlier um titan is very hard to play around at all there's a few cards you can tech for it obviously emp is the big one it removes all the artifacts at once um if you're playing songhai you can play stuff like blood rage mask and four winds magi and again you know keep those cards in your opening hand or early on like try and draw into them once your opponent is approaching the titan turn they're not terrible anyway they'll help you race um, and it means you can get in damage while you're killing their endless stream of minions because they don't have any non-minion cards in the deck. They're just always going to play a minion every turn. Um, so if you can hold on to some answer to the Titan or try and kill them first, which is quite difficult because they're going to put a stream of beef in the way. But um, When in doubt, the golden rule, if your opponent never gets to cast their card, it doesn't matter how good it is. So like, worst comes to worst... If you're really struggling playing around stuff, build a really fast aggro deck and just go for it. And see how that works. Um, it doesn't always, you know, desolate is a problem, but there are certainly ways to race these power cards that means your opponent never gets to deploy them in the first place. So I think that about wraps this up. In summary, um, there are very good cards and powerful plays that each faction can make. You will come up against them, probably on curve, in most games so it's worth having a plan for them knowing what to do so that you don't panic um and you go in prepared mitigating the effects of these power cards meaning you don't have to be sad about it on reddit win-win um i am joking obviously <laughs> salt is allowed uh but until next time thank you very much for watching and i will see you then